what would appreciate the kindness of the friend is a fairly far arrangement. It certainly adds a great deal to the pleasure of these occasions. This evening we must conclude our all too brief survey of the works of the Acrostic Paracelsus. I won't concede that it's much too long. We have many, many fields that we'd like to briefly mention and hope to cover as much ground as we can. It is regrettable that sufficient time and study cannot be devoted to so important a theme. But by way of introduction, we hope that these talks will cause students to take a personal interest in research on the Paracelsian corpus, which is a great body of work. We'd like to mention in passing in connection with the concept of universal sympathy, the Paracelsus used the term imagination in a rather mystical and almost oriental manner. To him, the word imagination contained within the heart of itself the word magic. And to him, the power of the imaginative faculty was something of such tremendous importance that he regarded it as the most dynamic factor in human consciousness. He felt that by imagination, the human being came nearer to attaining freedom, or to advancing individual and collective growth than by almost any other means. Imagination is man moving away from himself, out of the commonplace, escaping from the boundaries and barriers of tradition and authority, creating. Therefore, he made great point of the importance of training imagination in the divine magic of the universe. He held that imagination more than reason was the hope of humanity. All good things begin as dreams, and extending themselves in uncharted directions are sustained by the tremendous creative vitality of man's mental and emotional complex. He held, therefore, that imagination is more than the individual creating. It is the individual coming into sympathetic relationship with creation itself. Under the law of sympathy, Paracelsus outlined the concept of divine imagination. If man can imagine the universe, he can experience it. Imagination is a magnificent bridge by which the individual can come into sympathy with the future, restore the past, and broaden the frontiers of the present day. To reach out by imagination toward truth is to discover new and useful things. Therefore, the test of creative imagination is that it forms a dream under which science can build a foundation. No great creative thinker, no great scientist, philosopher, or theologian can be deficient in imagination. Without it, we are slaves to what is already achieved. With it, we build upon achievement, expanding it forever into the great world of universals. For well, imagination is like a miner who is digging out of the unknown earth of space precious ideas 
coming gradually to learn and to know and to dare, and even then, perhaps, to have the wisdom to be silent. Most of all, imagination is this sympathetic magic for whatever we can encompass as a creative experience within ourselves, we become light. We come into sympathy with it. It is like the old story of dreaming true. If we can dream true, we are true. And if we can imagine correctly the measure and proportion of the world, of the human soul, and of the universal mystery, then indeed we possess these things which we have imagined, or perhaps we are possessed by them. Therefore, the training of imagination is of the greatest importance to the young, and release through it is of equal importance to those of older years. Man dies when imagination dies in him, but when it dies, he is willing to settle back into the humdrum and the monopoly. But as long as he is challenged by the visions in his own inner life, pressed on to make dreams come true, he finds that the greatest of all arts, magic, is the art of dreaming, and that the scientist and the philosopher are servants of these dreams, helping to make them come true, helping to make real things man has discovered to be possible. However, imagination can also become a terrible enemy, for if it is left untutored and uncultured, it can burden us with extraordinary fears and cause us to regard the whole world around us as something terrible, frightening. It can cause us to face life with the gravest foreboding. Thus, the perfection of imagination is man's release from the misery of his own subjective fear. Creative imagination fills him with hope. Destructive imagination fills him with terror. The training of imagination, therefore, is the sacred art, according to Karasokas. It is the art of the individual building his dream upon the solid conviction that in the universe all things are good. He uses imagination to find answers that justify life, rather than to develop various attitudes loaded with the sense of injustice or burdened with terror and confusion. Man wishing to find a world of good around him can create it out of his own creativity. But if he is convinced that all is ill, evil, sorrowful, he will then force this into fulfillment in his own life. Uh, the creative imagination of Paracelsus is very much like the meditative discipline of the East. It is the problem of the individual gaining skills in the internal visualization of eternal reality. This in itself, according to Paracelsus, is the secret of the human being <laughs> having the courage to attempt that which may appear and factually is impossible. Namely, man's experience of the total life of the tremendous plan within which he exists. He has no limitation. Perhaps he cannot accomplish all immediately. Perhaps vast time must pass. The spirit man preserves his power to think before himself, to dream beyond achievement, to visualize or envision better and more wonderful states. He will proceed. He will advance. He will move inevitably toward his own perfection. The discriminating of the imaginative faculty the training of it, therefore, calls into play practically every knowledge that he possesses. From a solid education, he learns certain laws and principles. He becomes aware of the great directions of motion. From the consideration of philosophy, 
He becomes an ethical creature, strengthening his moral and rational powers, so that his imagination will never escape from that which is valid, from that which invites to progress rather than to chaos. From religion, man gains a powerful symbolism which can vitalize his imagination and can cause him to reach out toward the apperception of deity and the great states of consciousness which transcend our mortal ken. Thus, imagination must be served and directed. And if we wonder what state our own creative faculty may be in, we merely, we merely need to consider what it does to us. If as a result of our imagination we are hopeful, inspired, dedicated, then we are moving triumphantly. If, however, imagination has only been an instrument of torture, something that has given us further and more profound doubts on every subject, imagination which has caused us to see the invisible world around us filled with demons and evil spirits, an imagination which causes us to feel that the finger of providence points at us with some negative or terrible malediction. If these things are in the imagination, then they are morbid. And the imagination is untrained, but has fallen from the into delusion. So the positive pole of our creativity is imagination and the negative pole is delusion. And the individual who finds evil in the divine plan is always deluded. But the individual who finds God in everything has created imagination. The simple summary of a long and involved discourse, but perhaps it will point the way of his thinking. And perhaps it explains better than almost any formal approach we could make the entire philosophy of the life of Paracelsus. He was born apparently with a strange gift of imagining truth. He was able to look around and see in common things wonderful mysteries. He was also able to look out into the mysterious and see in all mystery common things. To have this wonderful faculty brings the world into a focal, a focal condition for us, <coughs> where all mysteries are simply a simple truth not yet understood. And all simple truths are mysteries that have been grasped, have been estimated and examined. And that which lies beyond our knowledge is not strange, wild, weird, or distant. It is merely simple truth, not yet experienced. And we move forward with complete victory into the unknown, realizing that we shall never face a horrible or terrible condition. The only horror or terror that we can know is in our own misunderstanding. The only evil that there is is rooted in the selfishness of man. If man can overcome this, he can live proudly in this world, live with the true sense of the dignity of himself and of life and of purpose. This brings us perhaps to one of the outstanding examples of the creative concept of Paracelsus, and that is his conviction of the interrelationship between macrocosm and microcosm. We have to realize that this concept did not originate with him. It goes back to a very early time. In fact, we find traces of it in practically all the civilized groups of mankind. Back in ancient times, man was governed by a simple law, the law of analogy. It was inscribed from the statue of Nebo, the god of wisdom, that stood in the midst of the great Babylonian culture. Nebo was the lord of the writing table. A tablet and stylus were his symbols. He later became identified with the Egyptian folk, who in turn we remember as Hermes. Nebo, upon his ancient tablet, bore the inscription, What has been, will be. That which is superior is like to that which is inferior. That which is inferior is like to that which is superior. 
I have spoken. I am Nebo, Lord of the Writing Table. This law of analogy is the foundation of ancient science, and it continues to dominate the thinking of men until the end of the 17th and early years of the 18th century of the Christian era. After that time, the rise of experimental science obscured this total view of man, which was the strength and power of ancient thinking. The concepts of man as the universe and the universe as the grand man faded with the rise of those schools of thought which later gave us the Darwinian concept and after that the works of men like Huxley and Jean. Actually, however, these men never disproved the law of analogy. They gave us other patterns, yet periodically we find revised in the experimentations of modern science the definite indication that there are these analogical laws, that various levels interrelate, and that on certain levels certain laws operate consistently. But just as surely as we have octaves in music, so we have octaves in chemistry. That which can be demonstrated upon one level is essentially true upon other levels, although we may not be able immediately to examine uh, these uh, parallels or these common truths. Recognizing, as we've mentioned in the first lecture of this series, but there are three great texts uh, which man may consider in the search for essential knowledge. These being the universe, the sacred word, and the human body. Paracelsus pointed out that the universe is rather too large to be immediately comprehended by anyone. The only approach that we have to the universe is through analogical imagination. Having perceived some smaller operation of nature which is within our understanding, we assume that we have discovered a law operating throughout nature. Thus the whole concept of natural laws operating without exceptions upon various levels, this concept is founded in analogy. This law of analogy tells us, uh, if we examine into it further, that there must be correspondences in all parts of the universe, and that these correspondences coming together form patterns which can be examined. Paracelsus pointed out that the most suitable and the most proper symbol from which man can learn the most about all things is his own body. This is for several reasons. First of all, because it is a miniature living thing. Man, with his almost incredible power, faculty, function, is a magnificent structure taken for granted, the depths of which have never been founded. Man in his own existence reveals almost miraculous powers and attributes which have come so commonplace that we ignore them. Let us also say, for example, many men have sought throughout the world for the secret of the transmutation of metals. And yet the greatest transmuting process that we can conceive is the process of human digestion. Here we have an amazing situation. Man taking all forms of nutrition into himself, passing them through the alchemy of his own digestive procedure, and ultimately producing therefrom a pure essence of life by which he sustains himself. Although man eats many foods, he never comes to resemble any of them. They are never found again as separate factors anywhere in his constitution. He may live a lifetime upon a single food, yet he will not resemble it. He may mix his diet incredibly and may eat many things that are of doubtful nutrition, yet all of these different food elements within a certain bond of reason combine, pass through a strange digestion and are transformed into something that helps man to live. This something is a pure, invisible essence. 
This essence carried through the body by its elaborate and wonderful mechanism maintains this organism in a relatively healthy state. So here we see the greatest miracle of all, the miracle of man living from food, man actually living from death, or even the grain that is put into the bread is baked, becoming thereby sterile. And yet from this sterile source comes his nutrition. All alchemy, therefore, can be understood, all substances transmuted, all elixirs discovered, if we are ever able to solve the mystery of how man lives from the food that he eats. Here's a simple example of the analogical law in operation. Men may speculate for centuries, thousands of years, in laboratories with dead elements or live elements, but they can never have the same certainty that might come to them were they able to base all their experiments upon a thorough knowledge of the function of the human body. Nor did he stop in his consideration at this point. Every part of man has locked within it secrets, secrets the understanding of which would help man to survive, help man to solve the mysteries of his own existence. Nor should we regard man merely as a physiological mystery or a biological one. Man is also a great economic mystery. And within his body is an infinite system of compensations for labor. Compensations entirely beyond the theory of our economic procedure. Yet every workman is worthy of his hire. And in the human body, every workman receives his hire. Every workman is paid, paid not in material coin, but paid in the substance of life upon which it must depend, paid suitably, properly, and promptly, so that there is not one who does not receive the wages which he earns. Also, the human body is an incredible political structure, so with its infinite diversity of parts, each with its own instincts, its own problems, its own requirement for survival, its own insistences, and its inevitable process of surviving if necessary at the expense of other parts. Yet with all this strange, complex, cooperative competition which we find in man, we also have total government. We have a strange democracy enveloped within an absolute autocracy. We have a democracy in which all things must be served, all things must be protected. And we discover, as Paracelsus points out, the actual pattern of autocracy, namely that the true autocrat is the one who sacrifices all to preserve the good of his people. The autocrat is the one who has the privilege of intelligent leadership. And the moment the autocrat in man becomes indifferent to the security of his subjects, the various parts of the body and its functions. Immediately these functions are deranged, and the autocrat loses his empire. The human government should be built upon the same strange recognition that it is the inalienable and inevitable duty of all superiors to protect inferiors that it is the absolute requirement of the strong to defend the weak, because there is not the weakest cell in man's body which must not be defended or the entire economy is in danger. Thus it is that the leader must serve. And Paracelsus also points out that in a wonderful way nature has so established this that in many regards the leader serves without knowing it. Man is not aware of his own benevolence. He is not aware of the fact that in the subconscious processes and autonomic processes of his body, he is guiding and guarding better than he knows. But while his mind is confused and uncertain, he is still contributing rational impulse to the maintenance of his bodily autonomy. Thus, perhaps, whereas man does not know how to rule the world in which he lives, he might learn by relaxing and trying to know how 
he so successfully learns the rule, the world in which he exists as a person, his own body. All these mysteries, mysteries of religion, philosophy, and science, are locked within the microcosm, the miniature, the small pattern of all things which we call man. The Paracelsus followed very largely in the direction of the Neoplatonists in establishing the great concepts of analogy. Paracelsus pointed out that man's sovereignty over himself, his survival as a creature, was only possible because he existed as an internal compound. It was more to man than body. That he realized, and this, of course, most advanced thinkers of the world have conferred. However, there is much more to it than this. To the Paracelsian thinker, the entire story of man is a revelation of invisible causes. Man is like a stream pouring out of the unseen. And just as the great mother of waters, the Yangtze River, makes fertile the plains of China, so this stream pouring out of the root of man makes possible the maintenance of his mind, his emotions, and his body. Man, therefore, is a being like the familiar iceberg, only a small part of which is visible to us, the greater part hidden and concealed by the veil which is forever across the face of Isis. To understand man, therefore, we must take into account these invisible parts of him. And here our creative imagination helps us to supplement the things that we see and know. In the first place, the very functions of man require and inevitably demonstrate a power and an intelligence superior to themselves. If man can think, if a human being can have a destiny, must arise from something greater than body chemistry. Because these separate cells and parts of man do not have the authority which he possesses. And Paracelsus would not acknowledge that the sum of these lesser lives became inevitably and automatically a greater life. In other words, if a thousand persons, all ignorant, keep together, their common opinion may not be entirely wise. They cannot produce out of themselves a mind superior to their own. But in man, tiny cells, molecules, even electrons, atoms, all these heaping together to form tissue and structure, all conspiring together to form the common body of man, these, by their minglings and by their cooperation, produce a structure which we call man. Paracelsus insisted that this structure was ensouled, that it became the instrument for a power invisible, that these structural parts, the atoms and all the substances and tissues, were like the stones of a house, which when it was built was inhabited by a person, by a living being, who proceeded to adapt this house to his needs decorated according to his inclination, and protect and maintain it if he is a prudent and thoughtful householder. From the invisible part of things, there must come this tremendous flow of life. And as we pointed out earlier in this series, this flow of life, while we recognize it almost as a unity, as one tremendous essence, still this flow of life, is able to support and sustain an infinite diversity of activities. This again reminds us of the Yangtze River. For along the shores of the river are hundreds of villages, and in each of these villages are people living their lives, fulfilling their purposes, practicing their trades, holding their convictions, worshiping their gods, bringing new life into the world and burying their dead. No two of the persons living along the sides of the river are identical. Yet all depend upon the river. 
Thus is this stream of life moves into the human body. No two cells will identically react, yet all will be commonly nourished. And Paracelsus carries this on into the level of religion. And he points out that the mystery of God and holiness is a river likewise, that flowing into the hearts of different persons causes each one to be differently but inevitably strengthened, so that each out of his faith is strengthened to his own work, yet dependent upon one life, one divine conviction, for the courage and the wisdom to go on to the separate achievement which may be desired. Studying, therefore, this background, this river pouring forever out of space, Paracelsus made considerable use of both the Neoplatonic and the Moslem doctrines relating to these things. He also borrowed much from the Kabbalists, whose ancient speculations concerning the great man of the Zohar fascinated him, because here was this magnificent image whose body nature is and God the soul. And he beheld the grand man fulfilling its destiny. And he also beheld its part, all the cells of the universal body. And he numbered man among these cells. Yet as these cells exist and are inevitable, not one human being can be lost. Not one human soul could die without this entire economy being shaken. For there is a certain wholeness, a certain totality, from which there can be no deprivation. Nothing can cease. Everything must change. But this great body to be healthy, this universal body which is the body and anatomy of the structure of deity, is like our own body. Part of it cannot be sick and part well. For this reason, Paracelsus objected strenuously to the idea of hell, because he said there could be no place of death and destruction or of eternal punishment in a body which must be healthy in all its parts in order that the universal mystery shall be maintained. So by many byproducts of thinking came to him along the way, perhaps due to his creative imagination, reaching out into principles that he had discovered and applying them to the uncertainties and worries that have afflicted mortals from the beginning. This river, this stream, flowing out of space, passes through three great conditions, according to the Paracelsian concept. And these three conditions correspond essentially with the nature of the universe. Paracelsus the universe consisted of three parts, which we call stellar, planetary, and elemental, or elementary. The supreme part of the universe corresponded mysteriously to the sphere of the fixed stars, or what we call constellations. Here, of course, the Neoplatonists had borrowed from their master Plato, for it was the belief of Plato the souls coming into generation descended from the Milky Way which was the birthplace of souls. Paracelsus was not so literal in his thinking, but he declared that, the, that in the physical universe, the great stellar diffusion, which we call the cosmic energy, or the cosmic space factor, populated with a vast universal population of worlds. And which we recognize primarily only as suns. But this had an analogy to the spiritual thought of things. Perhaps he was thinking or had been taught uh, the legend of Muhammad's night journey to heaven, where he ascended through the orbits of the planets and finally went through the door in the ceiling of the sky and passed into the world which is above. Similar thinking is represented in the Apocalypse of St. John and also in the Divine Timander of Hermes. But according to uh, the Paracelsian concept, there is a state or condition of life 
which we would call today cosmic or universal. This condition of life is a kind of energy in which the stars, all suns in the centers of solar system, the stars like the angels of Faust sing together. But there is a tremendous field, the field of space in which suns grow, and that the great common energy denominator of space itself is this effulgency which sustains the solar orbit. There are thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps millions and hundreds of millions of suns. Each of these is a self-radiant, splendid globe. Each is a light shining in the darkness for aeons of time. Each of these suns is the parent of planets, and they live only because of its light and life. Planets are embryos. Only the suns are born. Therefore, the suns are a race of living things inhabiting space, a race from whose compound nature, like the Milky Way, a vast body is formed, a body universal in its dimensions and proportions, with each of the suns a sparkling center of light somewhere in the mysterious nature of infinite peace. The radiance of all these suns together, and the rays that pour from them, weave together the living, luminous body of the infinite. To Paracelsus, the term spiritual is properly apportioned or attributed to that kind of energy which feeds the sun, feeding them directly, maintaining them in all their infinite splendor and in their infinite diversity. This life is so vast but we can have no concept of it. It sustains not one sun or even a thousand suns, but blazes out in space far beyond our comprehension, maintaining perhaps as many suns in the sky as there are grains of sand in the earth. This immensity cannot be grasped by our reason, cannot be understood, but it can be imagined. And by this power of imagination, man can conceive of infinite life. And he can conceive of it because he has a little symbol to help him. And that symbol is the night sky. A symbol in which he can see these points of light flickering in the firmament. And he knows that he is living in a world of giants, a world of incredible beings. And he cannot know how these beings fit together, what their patterns are. But he has already, not only through his imagination, but also through certain observations, made over a period of thousands of years, he has observed that this great world of suns is not merely battered in space. It is not merely a mass of light tossed by some strange universal providence into existence. These suns are races. They are organisms. They are vast social integrations. All these mysterious luminous, luminous bodies obey laws, move within the magnificent rhythm of their purposes, sustained and directed not only by infinite life but by infinite wisdom. So out of all of this vast thinking, Paracelsus formulated his own definition of spirit. Not merely an absolutely invisible, intangible, ghostly energy somewhere in the source of things, but as the supreme, all-enclosing life. He recognized that these suns, each was like a tiny lamp with its root or wick in a common substance. These suns burn not of themselves alone. Their incandescence was due to the fact that they all had a common fuel. And just as man gains a common fuel from water and air, 
and as breath is possible to him, he lives. So there is a common life, a common air, a common water, a common fuel, which sustains all this vast galaxy of things. And as these suns go on in constellational orders, in vast structures beyond our dreams or our thoughts, there can only be one answer, namely that there is an infinite fuel, an absolute life, that all living things have their final origin in this, and that no form more magnificently reveals this than the great structure of the constellational diffusion. For here we see the greatest conceivable manifestation of life. Here we see life so vast that our sun and all its planets could be lost in one atom of it. And yet, with all this life, we see law. And we see this vast light moving downward sequentially through order after order until some part of itself, some minute fragment of its own completeness, sustains the smallest insect, sustains the tiniest cell, and marks truly and inevitably the coming and going of the humblest of tiny things. Thus everything, from the sun to the moat that dances in the light, all these things are part of one endless concatenation or order of life, descending from the vast to the least, and yet permeating all, not only with the nature of life, but with the inevitable desire to live, to carry on, to produce and generate their kind, to have their day in that life, to love that life, whether they know it or not, to sleep when it departs, to waken when it returns. So to Paracelsus, the simple statement that man's spirit comes from the stars implies that he regards man as rooted in this ineffable energy, in this absolute life, absolute law, absolute wisdom. And from this internal and wonderful contemplation, Paracelsus was able to rescue himself from certain of the theological problems of the time. He lived in a day when men died at the stake for denying that the stars were candlesticks set out to guide late wanderers home at night. Bruno died at the stake because he said the stars were not fashioned primarily for the use of man. Yet even in our more recent and enlightened thinking, we perhaps have not had the imagination to really sense the immensity of this power by which we gather together into the simple word God. Paracelsus sought to give us a larger meaning of this word. He sought to remind us of the true infiniteness of deity. And in that infiniteness to remind us we could no longer be dealing with a simple sectarian divinity whose concern was primarily man and who had forgotten even to provide for the beasts of the fields in his pattern of redemption. This was not conceivable. All things had their places and man himself was one of the lesser stars soon in space. All tied together, bound together, in this immense dance of life, this endless rhythm of the universe itself. Therefore, if man carries with him into existence this spark, this ray, in the fire altar of the infinite, man has within himself the spiritual darkness of night. He also has the unseen field from which all this energy comes, the dark earth, the unexplored dimensions of matter and time and space. And within this dark earth of the unknown which feeds him as it feeds the stars, man also contains within himself a constellation of luminous points, a tiny sun gleaming and glowing. And if we could see him and understand him totally, 
you would see that this thing which man calls his spirit is actually a vast constellation of divine light. And that this spirit, with all its suns, with all its magnificent patterns, with its laws and its rules and its divine mathematics, this spirit, could we see it, would be a miniature of the sky at night. If we could look outwards and see the stars in the sky, we would feel that we had ordinary vision. But if we could look inward and see the dark sky of man with its infinite constellations, we would then wonder that we would understand Paracelsus, who said that the heavens and the earth are in man. But just as surely as he lives in the midst of the great universal diffusion, if you go deep enough into man, you find this diffusion again. You find that man inwardly is a vast constellation. A constellation not composed of immovable objects, but of these spark suns, rotating, revolving, and moving, and supplying their energy to the planet which they bring into generation. And just as the space around us is filled with suns, the different compositions of which can be determined to a lead degree at least uh, by the solar spectrograph, so in man, each of these stars in him that form together the jewel of his spirit, each of them is a little different. Each is an instrument for a purpose. Each bears its own planet. Each fashions a world according to its own needs, desires, and laws. Thus as surely as every sun that we see is potentially capable, at least, of having planets. So, each sun in man is potentially capable of having a planetary family moving about it, a family which exists from its benevolence, in a family which is the unfolding expression of its own life. So as Paracelsus pointed out, the spirit comes from the stars. So the soul of man comes from the planet. For the soul of man is like a planetary system moving around the great matchless altar of the sun. Thus man compositely is also a solar system with a sun in the midst of it. We do not realize it, but could we examine the great sun ball in the sky, it would not be one ball as we think it is. It would be an infinite grouping of luminous, blazing units. In man, the spirit is not just one uh, spiritual essence. It is a magnificent alchemical mystery a union of spiritual rays and energies forming one vast spiritual flame which we cannot distinguish or separate, but is which contains an infinite number of parts, all resident within its own nature. Around this blazing central light moves the children which it has fashioned, the planet. And according to Paracelsus, the planet Occupy symbolically and allegorically the place of the world soul. Now, as all suns have their common light and their common field and their common procreativity, yet each sun, once it has come to be a blazing center of light, brings forth from itself its own soul or its own planetary family. And in our particular system, this soul, according to the Paracelsian theory, consisted of seven parts and an eighth or receptive instrument. Thus, he again follows the Neoplatonists, enumerates the eight parts of the soul, again following Pythagoras, who declared the soul to be an osdoad, or a symmetrical structure with eight sides. The soul, then, consists of the energy of the sun differentiated through planetary instruments. These instruments are also alive. But these instruments have not yet reached the point in which their internal luminosity 
gives them the right or the power to be sons. Therefore, planets are growing in space as the soul is, gaining certain strength from within themselves, but still dependent upon the light of the sun which they reflect. Thus, Paracelsus says, the human soul reflects the light of the spirit. And because it is a reflector of light, those who are not wise assume that it is the source of light, and the source of light. And here we come for a pretty problem for the psychologist. For according to the psychologist, the soul of man is himself. According to Paracelsus, it is not. The soul is no more the source of light than is the planet, the source of the soft glow by which we can see it. This light is reflected from the sun. And bathed in the light of the sun, the planet appears to have a light of its own. In the case of man, the soul, bathed in the light of spirit, seems to be a being. And it is a being of a kind, but not yet as luminous or complete as we would like to think. The soul lives only because of its dependence upon the spirit. And what we call soul powers are the differentiated aspects of spiritual energy. In the Paracelsian concept, therefore, the seven planets known to the peoples of that time, the number is arbitrary but representative according to him that in each solar system there may be a different number of planets. But whatever the number may be, that number by archetype determines the divisions of the psychic life of things living on that, so, or in that solar system. Therefore, if another solar system has ten planets, then the psychic structure of beings in that solar system will have ten parts. But always this light must be differentiated sequentially, all the way down through the order. And if the beginning of the system is septenary, if the power of the sun of a solar system is septenary, then every creature within that system must unfold according to septenary laws. Now we may say that we shall discover sometime that we are not a septenary. If that is true, then we will face the problem of integrating our concept that the soul perhaps have more elements than we imagine. If the principle is not disproven, only man's increasing knowledge may give him a fuller comprehension of the details of its application. The soul, according to Paracelsus, therefore, is a very strange and wonderful thing. The soul <coughs> is between the spirit and the body. It is composed of substances, which have their origin, like the origin of planets, in the common matter of things. But it is also receiving into itself and disseminating very markedly and powerfully the spiritual energy of the sun itself. Therefore, soul is a messenger of spirit. It is an extension of spirit. But it is more than this. It is a strange compound. For well, within its nature, the soul also possesses the principles and rudiments of matter. Thus, the soul is an immortal mortal, or a mortal immortal. It is represented by the interlaced equilateral triangle, indicating the equilibrium of divine or causal and material or effectual factors. The soul, therefore, receives from the body a certain heritage. It receives from the spirit a certain heritage. And in this middle distance where the soul is, the true humanity of man is established. And when the breath of life was breathed into man, he became a living soul. This, Paracelsus pointed out, has generally been ignored. We have assumed that man is an ensouled body. Actually, to the Paracelsian thinker, this is not true. To him, man is a soul inhabiting a body. If the soul has an existence of its own nature, and that man is actually a citizen of the universe of soul, the body is an accidental or incidental condition. Body is a process in nature by which soul becomes involved in the mystery of generation. It takes upon itself a material structure. But the moment the human being is born, he begins to fight again for his estate as a soul. 
And when he reaches maturity, we call this maturity the triumph of soul over body in the individual. We have a simpler word for it. We say he is mature. When we say a person is mature, we mean that his mental and emotional nature is capable of directing his life. To say this means the victory of the psychic field over the material and the perpetual adolescence or the retarded individual is one in which this victory is not so easily or rapidly achieved. Actually, therefore, a materialist or a person who is unaware or non-receptive to the concept of soul must still be, regardless of whether he knows it or not, a soul in a body. The soul is the significant part of man. For it is that part of man which contains within it the reason, the intuition, the emotion, and the magical power of imagination. If, therefore, we have to try to establish man as a citizen of some world, we would say that his natural residence is in the psychic atmosphere, that he is really living and evolving as a soul creature. To overlook this or to deny it, to fail to recognize it, is to narrow the opportunity of human life. It is to restrict us unnecessarily. And when we are so restricted and accept the negative factor, becoming obsessed by a kind of ignorance, then we may devote our lives merely to the perpetuation of body. We may concern ourselves totally with material things at the expense of our own soul nature. If we do so, we will simply retard the natural growth of the soul or make slower its evolution in failing to cooperate with it. Paracelsus has an idea in here which may be a little strange to many people. I have tried to trace it and I've come to the conclusion that he derived it from the old Egyptian philosophy and in this case, in all probabilities, it came through Neoplatonism to a degree, although it is not emphasized. Certainly it is dependent somewhat upon the Gnostics, but more directly upon the later Egyptian or Hermetic mysteries that flourished about the beginning of the Christian era. Paracelsus held, and Damien, a German mystic, followed him in the same thinking, that man, in a strange way, must earn immortality. In other words, the human being, though composed of immortal elements that are unchanging and inevitable, to attain conscious immortality, must become consciously alive in the sphere of soul. That if the soul does not receive sufficient development and maturing during life, it is not capable of maintaining consciousness after death. Now, this was the attitude of building his soul while he lives. And if he does not build it with some thought and some consideration, he will have a very poor and illiquid house when he is forced to depend entirely upon a sphere of activity in which he has had little experience. These things which we call competitive living and creature comforts, gratification, have very little place in the larger psychic atmosphere which is our larger home. And as surely as vitamins and food nourish the body, so according to uh, Paracelsus, virtue, beauty, and truth are the necessary nourishments of the soul. The individual was not learned uh, to recognize and venerate the good, who has not as yet sensed in his own soul the necessity of the beautiful. The individual who has not been willing to dedicate some part of his complex daily living to the maturing of his inner life will find himself underprivileged or without an adequate home because he has not built the house in which he is to live. Today we plan for the future here, believing that if we have foresight, we will have protection in our older age. In the Paracelsian concept, we must plan for that other age, 
at age beyond. And if we do not plan for it with foresight, we shall someday recognize our mistakes. Therefore, that the soul of man, nourished by heaven, is formed by earth. And the individual, rising from a material condition to the level of soul, does so through the release of creativity of consciousness, and by practicing those good things which are of the nature of soul, he becomes a living soul while yet he lives in this material world, therefore steps across into a sphere of activity already familiar to him, and continues to grow and to live and to learn as he has in this life. But if he has no love of learning here, he steps out into darkness. Not that he can be destroyed, not that he goes to some terrible punishment or perdition, but simply that he goes to sleep until out of experience in the far future, nature brings him back again into objectivity, where he will struggle again and go on and on until he builds this precious testament, which must be the garment of his eternity. Thus the soul is another kind of body, a body mingling spiritual and material factors, a body transparent and translucent, a body of light and beauty, a body like the famous garments of glory of the high priest of Israel, the fringes of whose gold-edged robes were hung with the bells of rejoicing. All these things man must understand because he is building the invisible vestments of his soul. So the planets, representing the soul, representing its powers, its sevenfold mystery, and the eighth power, which is the power to generate bodies, these things reside in the soul. Friendships that are real are friendships between souls. Bonds that are lasting are bonds between psychic sympathies and values. Dreams that will go on and transcend death are dreams of the soul. And the great problem of soul is not merely that it is inside or behind man animating him. It is that man himself is becoming a soul. That he is becoming capable of living as a creature of soul, knowing the gods, good and evil. This concept forms a very large burden in the philosophy of Paracelsus therefore must be included in his cosmic idea. Now the third part of man is the body. This body is derived primarily from the four elements and a fifth power which is a binder. This fifth power is the hypothetical medium known to science as ether. The four elements represent the base substances from which bodies are compounded and bodies are formed. And forms consist of two principles. A form is always an archetype or an idea plus matter. All forms, therefore, and all bodies are forms, must contain some proportion of idea and some proportion of matter. In ordinary bodies or forms as we know them, there are compounds composing various levels of growth and development. Therefore, bodies are consistent with their species and kinds. And bodies pass through laws of change and growth and development and age. The primary substances of bodies, therefore, are these four basic elements. For bodies are composed of a physical or material earth factor, composed of a humid element or material factor, of an igneous or fiery material factor, and an airy or atmospheric power. Now earth, water, fire, and air are all material, and yet only physical earth itself is immediately and inevitably associated with the stasis of body. Water is also material. And Socrates, in his vision 
nearly 400 years before the Christian era, declare that water was composed of tiny units of solid substance and that flowing was the result of these solid units falling over each other. But actually water was not a fluid at all, but a mass of dry units. We know this is true, but how he found it out it can only be attributed to the magic of internal imagination. He saw clearly by a power within, which is stronger than any instrument, and can take precedence over the most formal process of discovery. But these four elements together, forming body, are brought into a compound, into a cooperative, and from them the corporeal form of man is generated. They support and supply all of the elements necessary and they are prevented from scattering, separating, or departing, and are held together within a mysterious substance which Paracelsus said was a kind of invisible glue, and we know it today as ether. It is the binder. It is that something which tells us that all these substances do not move freely in space, but are held within the bounds of their kinds and the laws governing them. We know this is true also of sounds, where a radio wave passing through space and apparently formless in itself is not dissipated, but is capable of being reinterpreted by means of an appropriate instrument into sound. Thus we know that these waves moving through space move through a medium which prevented them from de being scattered, held them in a rhythmic order and pattern, so that they never lost their identity or became hopelessly diffused. In man, the entire corporeal organism is held up in this matrix, a matrix of ether. And it is from this matrix that the ghost or the shadow of death is generated. For death is actually the departure of the matrix. It is the separation or breaking down of the etheric binder. The etheric binder departing leaves the material elements, and these immediately return to their proper levels and conditions, unless they are artificially prevented from doing so. But even by artificial means, about the only element that can be held is the physical element of Earth. All of the others escape in one way or another. Thus the mummification of the body of the dead cannot hold the watery principle or the fiery or the airy can only hold the earthy. So that the mummified remain merely becomes a little bit of earth separated artificially from its common environment. So out of these four together, these elements combining in their own pattern, bearing witness for the elements of the extensions of energy into matter. By means of these elements, the corporeal structure of man is built up. And this corporeal structure, then, is derived from four worlds. It is a compound, and it is not only held by ether, but ether in turn holds it as archetype. In other words, all forms exist primarily as designs or patterns. And a pattern or a design is a rate of vibration. It is also the form, shape, or kind of thing which inevitably gathers around a certain type, mode, or condition of energy. Thus energy contains within itself the qualifying archetype, and when it enters and impresses itself upon any formal structure, this formal structure takes the archetypal form of that energy, fills into that mold or matrix supplied by ether, and becomes, therefore, a physical symbol of this energy archetype itself. Thus, every physical form is a true picture of the energy which enfolds it, which enfolds it or by which it is dominated. This uh, problem of energy and archetype brings in many interesting bypaths, many of which, unfortunately, we cannot explore, but one or two, perhaps, are worth consideration. We have also mentioned already that a body must be a compound. 
Even a material body, like a statue, has to be a compound. Even though we may not find in it any traces of the fire, aerial, watery spirit, still it is a compound because it is a form. And a form can only exist as a result of two natures uniting. It must result of, in, uh, or result from pattern and matter. And a form is pattern, matter. And pattern stands for the principle of intellect. It stands for the power of soul. Therefore, anything which has physical existence has at least rudimentary soul existence. And any physical structure, even an ordinary chair or table, has some kind of a psychic vibratory vortex because it is a form. And all forms have to have an invisible factor or they cannot hold together. Thus things have their laws and principles. Paracelsus pointed out that the simplest of these is the evidence that any physical thing created without obedience to the laws of its purpose is useless. If we build a chair and we do not so structure that chair that it can carry the weight of the person sitting in it, the chair is useless. And in order that it may carry that weight and be a properly structured chair, it has to follow laws. It has to be built by the archetype of chair in man. And it has to fulfill in a reasonable way the law governing the purpose for which it is intended. Thus the chair must be created by wisdom of some level and of some kind. The chair does not create itself. And the fact that it becomes a chair is due to the purpose which, in, uh, which activated its construction and that it fulfills the pattern requirements of chair. The same is true of all bodies. To have significance, they must fulfill the pattern requirements for which they were created. These patterns are not in the body, but are contributed by the builder. <coughs> Thus, in everything that man creates, he supplies creativity. He supplies the archetype in his own imagination, fashions or frames the design which is later to be perfected. And if his uh, imagination is perverse, then the form which he fashions will not fulfill the purpose which he intends. Thus there are patterns and laws behind everything. The term um, form, therefore, is also curiously appropriate to soul. For if man physically and objectively is a body, psychically he is a form. Spiritually he is an essence. So man consists of essence, form, and body. And that part of him which is form, as we said, must be a compound. And the great compound, the supreme compound in the mystery of man is soul itself. For within it are gathered the most perfect example that we can cognize in our level of understanding of the union of law and substance. The soul is a form, but it is a more volatile one. And because it is less dense, it is more easily modified and moved. Hence the soul of man is in a state of constant change whereas the body change must be very slow. Yet even in man, every seven to eleven years, the body passes through a major and complete change. But in the soul, this change affects not only the structure, but the appearance, the shape, uh, the dimensions. For the soul of man is a mutable body, a body capable of motion of internal motion within itself. The soul of man is forever changing. And the planets which form the soul have their orbits. And they move into various relationships with each other. For well, the psychic centers of man rotate around the spiritual vortex or the sun. And these vital centers in man, the planetary soul centers, are also in sympathetic relationship above to the planets. Therefore, the soul is peculiarly under the control of planets. 
And all planetary effects or aspects which are supposed to operate upon body actually operate upon soul. And these operations are then conferred upon body. The soul is therefore the mediator. The soul is the redeemer of bodies and the firstborn of the eternal. The soul is the only begotten son of the spirit. And it is also the firstborn of those that sleep. For it is the first of those that arise out of matter. The psychic energy arising from matter, arising from the experiences of materiality, is forever returning to its own psychic intensity or integrity. When we suffer, it is not because of the body alone. It is that the impulses of our material circumstances are impressed upon the psychic life. Man suffers not with the body, but with the soul. And had he no soul, he could not suffer. Every nerve testimony is carried from the body to the psychic field. Everything that happens to man has meaning only because of soul. Every important thing which he learns is measured ter in terms not of how much he stores in the mind, but how much is transmitted from the mind to the psychic center of consciousness. For these reasons, man suffers here below, but it is the soul that grows. Man passes through innumerable physical experiences which are meaningless unless the soul accepts and interprets them. In the same way, man attempting to plan or coordinate the purposes of his life coordinates not with his body but with his soul. For the soul is the leader of the body. And it is also the one that must pay for the mistakes of the body. But in these mistakes it pays very largely for its own shortcomings. The soul then is this person, is this being. And the soul, as it is reflected downward from the great center of life to become the planet, reflects itself again downward in the body through a series of binders and the soul is associated with the body through a concatenation of septenaries within the body. The soul's contact with the body is not merely a strange wireless telepathy. It is not something that simply means that whatever happens to the body, the soul becomes aware of. This awareness is due to the intricate construction of the nervous and psychical systems of the body, particularly the endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system. The soul, therefore, seats itself in man by being placed with its seven members in the seven great vital centers of the human body. And the soul, in order to generate and maintain body, must enter into the construction of body by impressing its own archetype upon form or upon matter, thus building form. The various parts of the soul, according to Paracelsus, do not become involved simultaneously. But in the process of embryonic development, one phase or aspect of the soul after another takes control or direction in the development of the physical form itself. All peoples in all parts of the world agree that the life of man, particularly the essence of which he is composed, takes up its natural and inevitable abode in the heart. In the heart, therefore, we have the throne of man's internal life. It is that part of the body which comes the nearest and most approximate to the, to the invisible source above body. The Buddhists call the heart the Septapana Kavan, or the house of seven rooms. For within itself, the heart contains seven distinct parts, or orifices. And in these, according to Hermes, the spirit first manifests its seven souls. Therefore, Paracelsus likened the heart to a solar system, with the sun in the center and the planets moving about through the mysterious processes of heart function. From the heart goes forth the great river, which is to be the great arterial system. 
And the consciousness of man, therefore, the life of man, is centered in the heart. And there also are gathered the seeds or roots of the seven psychic natures. For the soul exists primarily in the magnetic field of the heart. That is its link to the body. Now, having established its own invisible archetypal nature within the shadow of the spiritual wing in the heart, we can understand perhaps a little better why the statement is made in the scripture that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The heart, therefore, is that part of man which is the closest uh, to his spiritual nature and is also the armament protecting the soul and the psychic field. The arrangements of the psychic nature, therefore, though they may be registered variously, nearly always result in a heart disturbance. And any uh, wrong function or development of man will ultimately affect the heart. The Chinese physician is able to have his patient put his hand only through a hole in a curtain and taking the pulse of the person can tell immediately almost any ailment, physical or psychological, from which the patient suffers. It can all be told from the heartbeat, which is the drum of Shiva, the drum of life, the drum which beats the strange rhythm for the dance of the gods. Now the soul as a separate or primary polarization is centered in its own objectivity in the brain. The brain, therefore, is the positive pole of the spiritual life of man. And into the brain center we have drawn the seven positive attributes of psychic energy in manifestation. In the heart, these polarizations are archetypal. In the brain, they become formal. For in the heart, they are essence. In the brain, they are form. And in the generative system, they are body. The, the uh, psychic uh, pattern reaffirms itself in the three great structures of man. If, therefore, we study the brain, we shall discover in it, as Paracelsus points out, a complete organism again a strange and mysterious cosmos connected to the body by the isthmus of the neck. This mysterious body has its constellations in the frontal lobes of the brain, its planets in the posterior lobes of the brain, and within the in internal parts, the ventricles, and the organs within the brain itself are to be found uh, the root of manifestations of the psychic faculties on the level of form. Here then we have formalization of ideas in thought, formalization of emotions so that we can name the forty-some emotions of which man is capable. Here impulses are reduced to categories, and here these categories cause them to assume recognized and understandable appearances. Here also we have the seat of the reflective powers of the individual. We have here the gathering up of the testimonies of the sensory perceptions and how they are regulated and digested. And here is the means by which knowledge and learning begin their mysterious alchemical transmutation into understanding or experience life realization. The posterior or physical element parts of man's nature the elements have their seat in the generative system, which is the eighth power of the soul. And here we have the cluster of the elements and the laws and principles by which they are governed. And we also have the negative powers of the soul, representing those parts of it which are completely immersed in matter at the present time and have only instinctive or instinctual manifestation being still locked in a material space. This is the same principle that we find in St. Augustine's description of the city of God and the city of evil. According to Augustine, the New Jerusalem, or the city of God, was located in the upper part of the world, in the corresponding to 
the brain. In the city of Babylon, the city of darkness and death at the lower end of the spine. And they were connected by a mysterious ladder of 33 rungs, symbolical of the human spinal cord. All these mysteries are the universe stamping itself upon man. And when Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it again, one of the disciples asked if he meant the temple of his body. Therefore, the symbolism was not unknown even in those days. It's the mysterious analogy between the universal house and the personal house in which man lives, and the distribution of all these energies and their relationships. Up to the time of Paracelsus, very little was known concerning the development of such structures as the endocrine glands. But we know that there are seven primary and important ductless glands, and that the master of the endocrine arch is the pineal gland in the brain, although scientists today would rather prefer to think of it as the pituitary body. But we have here a mysterious necklace of seven beads, seven mysterious instruments, which are again used in the dissemination of soul into body. Now, just as surely as soul works through every tissue, as it works locally uh, through the great digestive alchemical structure of the brain, with its numerous parts and, devel and development. So it is also capable of a kind of psychic release through the autonomic or sympathetic nervous system and the endocrine chain. Now it seems that we have an interesting problem here. We have talked mostly up to this point of the power of the soul manifesting itself uh, as the energy the conditioned archetypal design impressing itself from itself upon body. We have to approach this again or in another way. For upon the ladder which Jacob saw in his vision, angels ascended and descended. Therefore, just as surely, a subjective life moving downward by psychochemical processes takes hold of, sustains, and molds the body into the purposes of the psychic nature. So man, objectively, is also attempting to move inward from the external sphere of his activity towards the source of his own life. He is seeking to become consciously aware of these processes that are unconsciously occurring within him. These motions of life to sustain him are automatic. He is not even aware of most of them. They happen. They are the ever-present proof of life. They rise from sources which he does not understand and produce effects which he does not understand. Yet he lives. And because he lives, he bears witness to a tremendous conspiracy of factors working together to make this mysterious and yet apparently very simple phenomenon possible. The possibility that he lives. Man, therefore, is consciously also seeking to know why he lives, how he lives. He is seeking in science to discover the laws of his life. He is seeking in philosophy to discover the purposes of his life. And he is seeking in religion to discover the sublimity or the divine goodness by means of which all things are justified, necessary, and important. Thus he is seeking from his objectivity to conquer the invisible subjectivity of himself. And here we have, therefore, two groups of functions or processes which are particularly concerned with the reaction of experience, consciousness, or objectivity upon the psychic self. And of these reaction centers, Perhaps the most balancing of all is the endocrine chain. The endocrine chain is peculiarly a two-way structure. It not only causes energy to move from the psychic self into the body, animating it and rationalizing it. It also causes the human being to have a series of conscious reflexes which become available to the soul. 
And it is through these endocrine structures and the sympathetic nervous system that the things we learn objectively become available to soul as soul power. They convey, carry the messages and help to maintain the equilibrium between the objective and the subject. The uh, autonomic ganglia has been referred to as the soul system in the body. The ancient writings tell us that this soul system, which is in a more direct rapport, because it is the system in which man is becoming soul conscious, that ultimately the autonomic system will take power over the cerebrospinal system, transferring the authority which is now vested in the mind as the administrator of the seven powers of the soul, back to the heart, uh, wherein these soul qualities may be known only apperceptively as spiritual experiences. This is a little difficult to explain briefly, but the point is that man is today reacting to laws which he does not understand. As man grows and becomes master of the use of laws, become self-conscious and able to personally cooperate with universal law. These system processes, which have been involuntary, become voluntary, and the human being attains to the personal, voluntary control of his own life. But this is only possible when the bond between the objective nature of the individual and his psychic field has been so intensified and strengthened that man governs body with soul. Until this is possible, soul governs body without the direct assistance of man. But as man becomes of age in terms of soul being, he takes over the government of himself. And as he takes over the government of himself, he becomes a son. He becomes a luminous self-center instead of being a reflector of light. Paracelsus worked out all of these and countless other analogies through his study of the human body. Now recognizing that the spiritual life of man is more or less identical with the sun, with this luminous center that is located in the heart, we come to the next problem. The sun in the human heart must have fuel. And this fuel must be derived from the human equivalent of space. Therefore, somewhere in man there must be an available link with space. Now space is the dark earth. Space is this mysterious substance, invisible and intangible, from which life oozes into manifestation as though drops gathering like rain and falling. Where in man, therefore, do we have this mysterious space dimension? And Paracelsus says that the space dimension in man is located in the marrow of the bones, that it is the bone marrow that corresponds most nearly in the human constitution to the universal field of dark potential, and that the human body is in a mysterious way dependent upon this mysterious bone marrow, and that this bone marrow, if it becomes deranged or injured, or is no longer able to supply the necessary energies that this bone marrow, if it's anything fails, this failure immediately represents itself in active function by the loss of the necessary life principle or the depletion of it, so that the various fields of light and power in man lose the root of their fuel. For the flame that burns in the heart has its roots in the marrow of the bone. And bone marrow is the space. And all the cells and all the life of space come out of the invisible darkness. 
and in man they come out of the bone. So he was uh, rather interested in the mystery of bone marrow and of the tremendous spiritual reality that was lost in it. If God is in the heart, this enormous field of God, where the seeds grow, directly relates to the marrow and its power to forever bring forth life. For the dark space dimension is forever fertile with life. Life drops from it into manifestation. In man, life drops from the bone marrow. This presents another analogy with which he was uh, so much intrigued. If, therefore, we come gradually to the summary of the Parasulfan doctrine, what do we really gather from all the things that we have been trying to learn? I think we gather that we have been dealing with a person strangely and marvelously ahead of his time. An individual to whom science is indebted for many things. And in a great many instances, science following the little light of his lantern has made great and benefiting discoveries. But Paracelsus, because he had imagination, because he had this creative vision within himself has gone beyond our present achievement in one particular, namely that he has experienced the absolute dependence of all knowledge upon the mystery of inward light. The Paracelsus believed in the total being, that every creature to be understood must be placed correctly in a complete pattern, that no phenomenon can be examined separately. For as he told the professors at Basel, if you separate the cells and analyze them, you will find no life, because in the process of separating them, you have killed it. Therefore, if you take the living creature, cut off one by one the arms, the legs, and the head, and keep on examining, you will say, I find only death, because in the cutting off of all these members you killed it. Therefore, by dissection and autopsy, or by criticism and analysis, you will never find life, because you will kill life by trying to take it apart. The only way you will ever find truth is by putting things together, never by separating them. Every separation is a destruction of unity, and every destruction of unity is a foundation of error. The more parts we accept, the further we are from one. And the whole search which man is making in learning today can only be successful if we can continue to unite that which has been arbitrarily divided by specialization, by ignorance, and by the basic inability of the mind of the untrained person to comprehend unity. Thus unity, to be understood, must be experienced inwardly. It can never be discovered for the sensory perception because they must, the senses, must bring in separate testimonies. These testimonies remain separate until reason integrates them. And even with reason, they become merely the united but still individual parts until understanding absorbs them. Thus our entire purpose is to restore bodies that we have killed by separation. We kill human society when we separate the human race. We have retarded the growth of peoples for ages by not overcoming of territorial, religious, and language barriers for everything that separates breeds death, and everything that is separated from the total life of its kind is separated 
from the great source of its intuitional nutrition. Thus we gain from Paracelsus this vital and important point that we come toward fact as we annihilate intervals, particularly qualitative intervals, and recognize the total life of things, realizing that we can never understand the existence of any single creature until we recognize this creature's place in the absolute complete pattern of existence. This means that all our researches, all our efforts, must in some way be directed toward the apperception of the scheme, the plan, in which all things are reconciled. Nothing is actually reconciled upon the level of body, because body is an artificial compound which can only be resolved. On the level of body, the natural tendency of all things is to separate. They separate of themselves. They are held artificially together depending for their temporary survival not only upon the etheric binder which holds them, but upon the soul continually impressing upon them its signature or its archetype. And they exist only because the soul is subconsciously holding them by a kind of meditation, a yogic power which is resident in the soul which holds these archetypes. The soul also is a compound, but according to Paracelsus, it is a natural compound. It is a compound, therefore, of compatible parts, and the seven parts of the soul are the seven elements of the great alchemical mystery. They are the seven sacred metals, now the soul as a formal structure consisting of its fixations and its phobias and its complexes and its mentations and its emotional reflexes, this structure or compound cannot be in its manifestation completely integrated. It cannot be coordinated into a state of unity. The only thing we can achieve is a condition of more enduring compatibility. But, as Paracelsus points out in alchemy, if the seven powers of the soul are reduced to absolute simplicity of basic essence, these essences are compatible, can be united, and out of the seven powers of the soul transmuted from their objective to their ultimate subjective nature, these seven powers, the lapis philosophorum, or the stone of the wise man, can be fashioned. The philosopher's stone is the perfect amalgamation of the seven essential natures of the soul. These natures, to be adaptable, must pass through birth, maturity, and death. Therefore, it is only with the death of the individual elements of the soul, the voluntary death of renunciation, that the essences can be completely cleansed of their burden of individuality and thus be made susceptible of complete union in the formation of the hermetic medicine. The soul, then, is again the phoenix, which rises from the ashes of its own dead. It is the symbol of the alchemical mystery, the mystery of the word which is made flesh, and then in turn, by being spoken, transforms all things into soul power. Beyond this is spirit, or essential nature itself, which is not a common. For spirit is the only fact in the universe that is not a compound. It has neither a positive nor a negative pole, nor is it the product of the mingling of other things. 
It is essential and necessary and substantial in its own nature, subsisting forever in its own essence, nourished eternally by itself, and nourishing all other things from itself. Because it is not a compound, it is immortal. And because it is not a compound, it is. But having no form has no definition. Yet being formless, it is the root of form. For from it come the soul archetype. But the moment a thing creates or manifests as a formal structure, it establishes an interval between itself and essence, and can never be reunited with essence until this interval is restored, overcome, or transmuted. The inevitable and ultimate end of all things is their re-identification with essence, this essence being substantially God. The true total nature of the consciousness of this essence is unknowable, but it must be regarded as total. Therefore, it is consciousness without objective or subjective, without subject or object in itself. A total consciousness as total awareness of totality. In this concept, then, the universal mystery unfolded by soul flowing from spirit and into body. The great regeneration or redemption of life is the reversal of this mystery, by which man, through the voluntary statement of his own conviction, resolves to reverse the process, causing body to flow back into soul and soul to flow back into spirit. The involutionary process is involuntary. The evolutionary process is of two kinds, either immediately voluntary, as in the case of the initiate addict, who has become master of the rule, and in a slower but still voluntary way through the process of evolution the means by which the individual is gradually strengthened in his understanding until he makes sequentially the natural resolutions which accomplish his regeneration. The difference between nature and art is only in this, that art can perfect nature by intention. All growth is moving in nature, but man has the power to grow more rapidly to the voluntary dedication of his own life to those activities which are essential to him. Man, therefore, is like the gardener, who is able to assist the plant to grow and to protect it from weeds. Man is able to do the same thing in connection with his own country. The subject, therefore, of the Paracelsian philosophy is essentially man, the object of this philosophy is man coming to know the great road by which he came and along which he must return. For surely, this is a kind of ladder to the stars. The individual is here, not to remain here as a patient creature from the cradle to the grave, but to remain here to grow in order that he may outgrow mortality through the integration of his objective and subjective life in soul unity. And having attained equilibrium upon the level of soul, then to repeat the process on a higher level, thus restoring soul to the spiritual root from which it came. All arts and sciences are useful only to the degree that they advance this form. All true knowledge advances this cause, knowingly or unknowingly. All false knowledge interferes with, restricts, or limits this cause. Therefore, it is the responsibility of knowledge that it shall do all possible to be, become faithful to its trust and capable of fulfilling the ends intended. Man is not intended to be wise alone. He is intended 
through wisdom to achieve the active work of his own existence. For knowledge, wisdom, and understanding are valuable only because they cause the individual to make the conscious decision of growth, and through this growth, to proceed along the path of the great transmutational redemption, or the transformation of mortality into immortality, and the restoration of the tremendous spiritual reality which is at the root of his being. In substance, that is the Paracelsian morality, the Paracelsian ethics. But our time is more than up. We must now leave Paracelsus and hope that each one of you will go on and be friendly with this grand old man who had many enemies because of his brusqueness, but also had many friends because of the fearless way in which he defended those principles which he held to be true and